Hello and welcome. There's often a comparison between India and China on the economic front. China's economic miracle is attributed to a whole lot of reasons, including governance, iron hand of the central government and so on. But could it be something else? Well, I am joined by S. Ramakrishna Velamuri, professor at the China Europe International Business School, who has a few different thoughts on the subject. Uh, professor, thank you very much for uh, speaking with us. It's my pleasure. So, so tell us, you've looked at this whole uh, uh, the, the China economic success story of the last three decades or so, and you've concluded that it's not really what we attribute uh, the reasons that we attribute are not really what uh, actually set it off and it could be something else. So, so the reasons that we attribute China's success to are basically uh, you know, a very proactive government that has made fast decisions mm -hmm. uh, because it's unencumbered by democratic processes, mm -hmm. uh, the experiments with the special economic zones, mm -hmm. um, a very uh, business friendly labor policies and so on and so forth. And I think those are, you know, right hmm. in, 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 you know, we are right in saying that those are partially uh, responsible for China's economic miracle, but they only paint one side of the, of the picture. There is another side that I think uh, the popular discourse does not pick up. And uh, I want to talk about the starting conditions uh, of China in 1980. If you hmm. look at, compare China and India between 1980 and 2010, this 30 year hmm. period, China grew at, uh, officially, officially they claim that they grew at 9.6%. Uh, there are some economists who, who claim that they grew at 7.85% over this 30 year period mm. per year. Mm. Uh, even if you take this lower figure, mm. China outperformed India mm. uh, significantly, right? And so I think uh, China's starting conditions were different and more favorable than India's in 1980. I would say in four respects. The first one is that they had a more educated population. In 1980, the literacy rate was 33, uh, 30 percentage points higher mm. than that of India. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1990, it was still 30 percentage points higher than India. Today, it's still significantly higher at 20 percentage points higher than mm. India. So India's literacy rate according to the latest uh, census in 2011 is about 75 percent okay. china's is 95 percent mm. so china started off with a much more educated population the second uh, difference is in healthcare. You, you look at any possible conceivable healthcare outcome and china is far ahead of india uh, once again india is slowly narrowing the gap but the difference between China and India, if you look at things like life expectancy, infant mortality, maternal mortality at birth and so on, mm. uh, China continues to be significantly uh, better than India. Uh, the third difference... And they had the innovation, uh, innovative approach to uh, addressing that problem through barefoot doctors. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. So the barefoot doctors played a very important role in uh, reaching primary health to the masses. Mm. Okay, so that was a, again, uh, you know, uh, an artifact of uh, uh, Chairman Mao's time. Uh, the third uh, big difference I would say is that uh, there is great gender equality in China. So the World Economic Forum um, uh, publishes a report called the Gender Gap Report, where they look at, in each country, they look at how well women are doing relative to, ma uh, mm. to men, right? And so they don't look at you know, the outcomes of, of women uh, in isolation. They look at them in relative to men. And they find that they rank China 61st in the world. And I think India is ranked 130th or 131st in the world. And very interestingly, China is actually ranked ahead in, in gender, gender equality, uh, ahead of uh, richer countries in the East Asian region, such mm. as Japan and South Korea, which is surprising to many. Right? Mm. But if you've been to China, you'll see why that is the case because you see women everywhere mm. you know you see women absolutely in every position in the workplace in every industry there are taxi drivers there are women who work in heavy industry women in the police force there are women in the air force in the army and so on and then you also have women in senior organizational positions both in the public sector private sector government much more so than in india mm. uh, just to give you a, a data point uh, th there's one metric that uh, the World Economic Forum uses to, to measure the economic empowerment of women, and that is the ratio of uh, the, 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 the ratio of the women working in the, uh, working in the workforce uh, relative to, to men. Mm. I think in the case of uh, China, for every uh, male working in the workforce, uh, 
uh, there is there are 0.85 women in the workforce, mm. uh, close to parity, sure. I would say. In the case of India, it's 0 0.42 women for every male. Mm. Okay, half of uh, less than half. Less than half. Right. Mm. So, so that there's a third big difference. Uh, so, what that means is that we have not actually made full use of, of our, our own workforce. Of our own yeah. workforce, right? Uh, and then I would say the fourth big difference I would I would say is that. Uh, I've lived in China now for six years. Uh, it's one of the most egalitarian societies that you can come across. It's one of the least class conscious societies that you can come across. Uh, so unlike in India, the, the surname of a Chinese person does not signal socioeconomic status, whereas <laughs> in India it does. There are only about 100 surnames in China. Mm. Okay? <laughs> and uh, mm. there is this deep belief in China that if you work hard, you know, and if you are industrious, you can climb the socioeconomic ladder. Okay, and that's a very powerful growth engine. Mm. You know, when you have millions of people who believe that and who believe that through their own efforts they can improve their their lot in life, right. that acts as a very very powerful. So the the fourth point, if I can quickly sort of quiz you on that. So uh, you're saying that even despite the whole sense of you know corruption and nepotism and everything else. That's not necessarily seen as uh, you know an inher inherited legacy and and the you know the need to be part of that or attached to a inherited legacy and so on. No, no. Uh, so so uh, since the economic miracle began, mm. you know there are uh, uh, these uh, networks of nepotism that mm. have emerged mm. actually. But uh, during Chairman Mao's time, actually, uh, he basically ensured that there was uh, an egalitarian society. And uh, the Cultural Revolution, in fact, was designed to achieve this, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and if you look at these four factors that I've just named, you know, education, healthcare, uh, you know, women's empowerment, and uh, uh, you know, the, the equality. The equality uh, these are not unique to China. They're mm. actually, uh, you know, a kind of a, a common factor in all communist regimes. Mm. You know, if you look at the Soviet bloc or the Eastern European uh, countries or even some isolated uh, communist countries in latin america such as cuba mm. you you find these you find these same characteristics so i'm not i'm not making a case mm. for communism by any sure. means right sure. uh, i'm mm. i'm absolutely a, a free market uh, thinker and i believe in the free, free market but the free market actually works best when uh, societies invest in human capital and uh, it's very encouraging to note that India has finally started to, 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 to make a serious investment in human capital. Um, investment in private primary education has gone up significantly. Uh, uh, investment in healthcare has gone up significantly. And as, at least in urban uh, so India, uh, you do see women in the workforce, right. in particular verticals such as the IT industry. Uh, I think the women uh, outnumber the men. So, so there are, you know, pockets where you know you do have equality and, and, and uh, women right. empowerment but we need to extend that to the rest of the country. Right so uh, if I would ask the question differently uh, would you say that a country like India therefore is not even ready for that leap of growth because we've not got most of these preconditions right? It It, it is ready for growth but that growth is going to be hampered mm. by these factors. Right? At the end of the day what I'm saying is that you know when, when the, the human capital of a nation is not as high as it could be, that's going to act as a break on growth. Uh, so all the, the, the sort of sense of command and control and which you associate with China and the firm decision making and all of that, you're saying that even if we were to inherit that for some, from, for some reason uh, in our democratic setup, is not necessarily going to result in anything fundamentally different or transformational because yeah. we've not yet fixed these problems. Fixed these problems. And in fact, you know, my, my uh, reading is that uh, just as we need to learn from, from China you know, to improve mm. our human capital, China can learn from us in terms of uh, being more de decentralized in its decision making. When I say decentralized, China is decentralized to a certain it extent is, yeah, in yeah. the sense that the provincial governments actually are quite, uh, are quite powerful. But when I say decentralized, I don't mean decentralized from central to provincial government. I mean decentralized to the private mm. uh, organizations and to, and, and, to, and to individuals, right? So, so th there has to be a lot more decentralization of decision making uh, away from government, whether it's central or provincial, to 
uh, private parties. Okay. So, if I were to now ask you to, you know, sort of give us a prognosis of sorts, how, how do you see India kind, uh, I mean, we are sitting in India and therefore, the interest is more about where this will go. Uh, if you were to look at where we stand in some, on, in these four social indicators that we just spoke of uh, and the pace at which it, things are changing, uh, whether it is education, healthcare, gender equality and all that and cons given that they are all now uh, higher up on the priority list than they ever were, uh, where do you see the catch up happening? I think the catch up is going to happen. I think uh, in my presentation today, I, I, I shared that uh, even though China is far ahead of India in terms of the size of the economy and growth rate, uh, there are some weaknesses that China has at this moment that are masked by its obvious strengths. Mm. Okay? Um, and the first uh, weakness is of course, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the age composition of the population or the, the demographic pyramid, right? As a result of uh, the single child policy, uh, China has become old before it has become rich. Mm. Uh, unlike industrialized countries that became rich first and then became old. Okay. Um, and China is already beginning to feel the heat, feel the, the negative effects of a shrinking labor force. Mm. Um, Companies, especially the labor intensive companies are finding it difficult to hire people. Uh, labor costs are going up a lot, you know, in double digits every mm. year. And this situation is only going to worsen. Um, so, of course, China could, this, this could be a trigger for China to leverage uh, technology and uh, be more innovative in its production practices, which could be a, a trigger for, for, for some great, great improvements in productivity. But China has to deal with this challenge. India is at a much better place. Uh, India's uh, median uh, uh, age is a, almost 10 years lower than China's. We could, if we played our ca cards right, uh, reap an enormous uh, demographic dividend. Uh, but if we don't, uh, then this, this, this uh, the age, age uh, you know, composition could actually backfire on us because we'd have a huge population of young people would have no work, right? And the key to that, I think, for, for India is to leverage manufacturing to a much larger extent. Um, China's manufacturing industry is eight times mm. the size of India's. Mm. And you, the, the countries are roughly the same size. There's no reason, you know, for, for us to be so small in manufacturing. We need manufacturing. Uh, that's where the, the mass, uh, masses get employed, you know. We need uh, lots of jobs for blue collar workers. And uh, we need to we need to have much more proact proactive and pro manufacturing policies. That's the first thing. The second thing is I believe that because you know our decision making is so de decentralized, um, we are actually more innovative mm -hmm. than than China is. Now China is spending about twelve and a half times what India is spending on R and D. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is private uh, in, the, in the private space? No, no, both, both. private okay. and government together. Mm. Okay. Uh, but in, I believe that the uh, outcomes in China are not commensurate with this much higher resource allocation. Um, I think India is playing its cards right. India is in, encouraging uh, private companies to innovate. And innovation is happening, you know, at, at all levels, you know, right. large organizations, mid-sized organizations, and small organizations. Uh, in terms of uh, productivity of our investment in, in uh, innovation, I think we are, we are doing much better than China. Third, I think uh, it is my, my view that um, although in terms of gross enrollment ratio, uh, we are lower than China in, in higher education, in university education, uh, our higher education actually has much better prospects because you have a much greater involvement of the private sector in, in higher education. And the private sector is the spearhead for innovations. You take the case of in India of ISB, mm. right? ISB came in and introduced a number of innovations like the one year mm. MBA, uh, lateral recruiting, uh, and even a research driven mm. uh, academic culture. Now, as a result of this, all the IAMs have adopted these, these practices, mm. right? It's questionable whether a, a, a governmental uh, academic institution would proactively adopt these practices if a private institution had not done it before, right? And so you, there are these examples everywhere, Correct. right? Mm. So sometimes, you know, having a, pri a private organization also disciplines the public organizations in the same sector. Uh, 
and uh, we have some some very exciting uh, initiatives by business families that have already made their wealth who are now setting up universities in India. I'm talking about, you know, of course, historically, there's been the Tatas and the Birlas who were yeah. the pioneers. Yeah, but now Shiv Nader and Shiv Nader, NIT, NIT uh, Hero, I mean. uh, Jindal, Munjals, you know, mm. uh, Manipal in the mm. South, VIT University, SRM. So, you know, India can easily become a major, major education hub for neighboring countries, South Asia, Africa, Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think we can provide exceptional quality education because we have the best educators in the world. You know, uh, educators have been successful everywhere, whether it's school education, mm. or tertiary education. And we just need these private initiatives to be supported by the government. You know, if they're supported, you know, we'll provide the best quality education at one tenth of the cost. Right. Um, and in the healthcare, I, as I said to you earlier, we are behind China in a number of respects, but because about 80% of our healthcare delivery is done through the private sector. Only 4% is done through the private mm, sector yeah. in China. Mm. You're also seeing a number of in innovations in India, both at the high end, you know, with the Apollos and the Walkharts and the Fortises and so on. But very interestingly, at the affordable healthcare segment of the population, you have uh, private sector players doing an amazing job, like Arvindai Hospital, Bewell Hospitals in, 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 in Tamil Nadu, IQ here in, in, uh, in, in Delhi, right? Mm. Um, uh, LB Prasada Institute, Life Spring Hospitals, Vatsalya, Narana Hrudayala, mm. so many, right? And the innovations that they introduce will diffuse to the other healthcare organizations. And that's how improvements will take place. Right, and that's, I guess, sort of completes the China thing, right? So yes. these are the advantages that we can start with while we're looking at, staring at the disadvantages yes. uh, that we still have to catch up with. But and and to be fair, I think we are, we are the, the, the nation as a whole, I think, is dedicating resources to addressing these 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 challenges that we face in education and healthcare and so on. So I think we're on the right track. We probably need to accelerate it a little more, mm -hmm. but we certainly do not want to copy from China its top-down, you know, government-led decision-making uh, process. Um, I think we are we are very well placed in that respect in India. We want you know the government to even withdraw from mm -hmm. some some areas. Um, but what we can learn from uh, China is the importance of human Get the basics right. Yeah. 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 Very good note to end on. Thank you so much, Professor, for speaking My with pleasure. us.